This is a production of Cornell University. All right, thanks, Frank. Thanks for coming today. This is something that I started at, at Madison before I had my little hiatus on this topic for my three and a half years here in, in, uh, in Ithaca, uh, working with Frank. And then this research will be kind of picked back up at Nebraska. And it's something that's really been pretty impactful uh, to our turf industry. And so I'm really excited to be able to share, um, share it with you today. Um, at Nebraska, I have a three-way split. I'm an extension specialist, so 50% of my time is extension. And then I have a 20% teaching load and a 30% research load. Uh, which I enjoy. People usually hate three-way splits, but I really do like doing all three aspects of the job. And from my extension side, I really focus on how to become more precise managers. Um, so, you know, how are we making sure that we're applying the right fertilizers, the right amount of water, the right products when it's needed? And one of the ways of doing that is to harness data and analyze data and to make decisions that are based on models and the latest research so that we're not, you know, getting stuck in these calendar-based systems. Kind of like uh, in turf, but also I know uh, from my time here and in a lot of our uh, crops like apples, right, we have these spray schedules. We sit there and we spray every week or two weeks because we, we can't tolerate any type of disease or any type of pest or in the turf situation, grass always has to look and perform well. And so we're trying, constantly trying to ba uh, balance uh, our inputs so that the grass is looking good, but it's not looking too good. Um, and it's also you know, free of any kind of a disease or a weed or insect pest. Uh, and so I'm really going to talk today about how do we use that data. It's going to be kind of a high picture, uh, kind of a high view. And I want to tell a little bit of a story of, of how I've gotten to this point where I started off, you know, with that backyard putting green. And, and now I'm, you know, the CEO of a, of a startup tech company. And, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a learning curve over the last 10 years to go from one to the other. So kind of my challenge is a in the turf industry, I think that the challenge of of uh, people like Frank and, and other extension specialists and different crops are, um, you know, there's a lot of information out there now. Social media has been huge for me. I've really been able to grow my, my presence in the turf industry. I think we have like 3,500 Twitter, Twitter followers and they're all turf people. And you just, it's a great way to get information out there. But when you have all these people constantly putting information out there, there's a lot of information that's new, things can get buried. And so that can be kind of a challenge. Um, you know, how do we gain better adoption of, practice, of our best management practices in agronomy or horticulture when we have, you know, good science, maybe bad science being uh, spewed through different social media sites? Um, that's, that's one of the challenges that I see right now. Another challenge is, is we have all this data we can collect. How are we taking that data and those data and we, we, we can bring them together so that we can make quick decisions? We, we don't have time to spend 10 hours a day trying to combine all these data and trying to analyze them and then make a decision. You almost get paralyzed by that data. And then also, you know, what's the return on investment to spending all that time or to buying the equipment or to paying for computer power to analyze all these data so that we can then make decisions. And so, great, I can, I can do GPS spray applications on my golf course or on any, any kind of farm. Am I getting a return either in playability or from an economic uh, perspective or from a time perspective? And so we really have to keep all of those things in mind when we're trying to understand what we can do as extension specialists to try to expand the reach of our, uh, of our programming. And we're seeing technologies exploding too. <laughs> so 10 years ago, no golf courses had these soil moisture probes. And now everybody has them. And they have an app now that this probe can integrate with. And then we have drones coming in the turf industry and they can make pretty maps, but they really can't still really tell you what to do with the information that's on these different maps. This is thermal imaging. There's different crop indices like NDVI or NDRE. And so we have all these different disparate sources of information. Nothing is talking to each other. I got my soil moisture map. I got my, my thermal imaging map. I have, you know, handwritten data from how fast the putting greens are from where the a, a cup might be cut on a putting green. How do I combine all that information? Right now, it's all spewed, um, spewed around. It's really hard for a, a superintendent or even a sports field manager to handle all that to then make clear decisions. And we also have a lot of weather models. And so this is uh, from a website that Michigan State does a nice job on, growingdegreedaytracker.net. And they take different past models. And from this, they can understand, you know, some of the phenology and some of the the uh, uh, different timings and life cycles of different pests and different uh, plants and give some feedback. But again, 
this is now another source of information that a turf manager has to actively seek out. I think that we're gonna to continue to see these models expand over time in our industry, and I think across a lot of industries. You know, pest models have historically been something that we've been doing research on now for 30 or 40 years. Uh, I think Frankie you probably have some research with annual bluegrass, uh, this particular challenging weed that's permit making seed heads, and when would you spray, or when would you expect to see these seed heads from occurring? We have some newer models uh, for really ch uh, challenging diseases like dollar spot. This is a disease that um, can be pretty problematic in our climate, and uh, um, some, some new models are predicting when that's going to emerge. We're also seeing some newer models, though, away from the pest models for things like nutrient use and growth potential. Before I'm here today, we were talking uh, in Frank's office about golf courses now actually just keeping track of how many clippings they're getting. And this seems like something that you'd think is kind of fundamental for growing grass. We would know about how much grass is, is being mowed because that's going to tell us how, how ability, its ability to kind of handle traffic, how nutrients are being uh, removed during that clipping being removed, how sugar is being allocated within that plant. And we're not really even doing that. And so that's an opportunity there that I think people are starting to explore. But I want to talk about some of the research that I started doing as a high school student and that's turned into what I've been doing now. And that's looking at plant growth regulators. And I'm going to use this as kind of the, the backdrop or the context to the story that showed how I've kind of developed um, into uh, building you know, this, this decision support tool. So plant growth regulators are frequently applied to you know, highly maintained turf, but they're also extremely uh, difficult to understand if they're working. And because of that, they're, high, they're very uh, frequently misunderstood. So most of the products that we're using in turf um, inhibit gibberellin biosynthesis, biosynthesis, and that hormone causes our leaves to elongate. So the more gibberellin that's present, the faster the grass is grown. And I'm sure many here that have to mow lawns probably would love to spray these plant growth regulators on your grass because you don't want to have to mow it as much. And so that's kind of what the, the thinking is behind some of these products. So some of the common ones, the, the most common one is a particular product, Conixapac ethyl, the very safe plant growth regulator, very minimal um, negative attributes, phytotoxicity is low. And then we have some, some other uh, PGRs, pathobutrazole and fluoropimidol. Uh, those are root absorbed PGRs, a little bit more uh, phytotoxic in turf, but still used pretty frequently. And so you might think, well, why am I putting down something that's going to make my grass grow slower on a golf course? You mow a green every day. You mow fairways two or three times a week. Well, the real benefit to these products come from they reduce clipping yields, which therefore reduce our nutrient requirements. And we're also mowing less of that stored carbohydrate off. So we see plant health benefits. We see an improved stress tolerance. Uh, and we also see enhancements in, in turf playability and performance. Uh, you know, see a denser uh, stand of turf. You see an increase in green color. So I got into this research because of this stress tolerance. When I was 15, I had that backyard putting green. I had a lot of shade issues by trying to suppress some of the phytochrome growth response from growing grass in the shade. We're putting these products down onto the turf. And uh, as a high school kid, I'm like, how, do you, how does this work? How do, you, how do you make sense out of this? So a superintendent I worked for kind of explained it to me. And this is kind of how, what I draw, um, had drawn up for how these products worked. So we have relative clipping yield here on the y-axis. So this is how fast the grass would grow if we did not apply a plant growth regulator. And then at day zero, I put down my, my Primo Max, my Trinex back ethyl. And we see that the clipping yield starts to grow slower and slower and slower, and so we see a 20% reduction in our clipping yield. Not a lot, but enough to improve that plant health and reduce that, that nutrient removal. And then after about a week, we saw it kind of wear off. And then all of the sugar that we'd stored and all the, the, the benefits that we gained in this suppression phase then kind of get burned later on in this rebound phase. We see a buildup of gibberellin uh, uh, precursors, and so once that, that PGR is gone, now the, uh, those precursors become active forms of gibberellin, and the grass grows like crazy, and it burns through carbohydrates, and all the plant health benefits we're trying to seek are lost. And so you'd think, okay, it's pretty simple. You know, you just have to just apply the PGRs fairly frequently to, to maintain clipping yield suppression. You want to avoid the rebound. So you might say I need to apply every about 10 days. 
You could also say, I'll just watch the grass. And when it starts to regrow, maybe I'll just reapply the PGR. The problem with that is the absolute clipping yields are all over the board. And this is what we were talking about in Frank's office before this. Things like mineralization of nitrogen, water status, uh, other environmental factors cause the absolute clipping yield to fluctuate a lot from day to day. So the black line here is, is plots that are treated or not treated with plant growth regulators. And the red lines are plots that were treated with plant growth regulators. And so there's times where we applied the PGR and we had less clipping yield. And then the PGR wears off and we see a little bit of a rebound. And then we reapply the PGR and we have a little more suppression. And then it wears off and it's rebounding again. But we're not maintaining that clipping yield suppression. So we're not maintaining all those plant health benefits. Therefore, we shouldn't even waste our money with these applications. And if we're like me growing grass in the shade, we're not really maximizing uh, uh, the, the health of that turf. And this is a prime example. This is the 2015 PGA Championship. I was volunteering there at Whistling Straits. Going into that, that tournament, they were dry, they were cool weather. And then the Friday before the tournament week started, they got three quarters of an inch of rain, and then it got really warm. We see a mineralization uh, flush. There's a big increase in plant available water. And we see really, really rapid growth during the week of the tournament. They ended up using the models I'm going to talk about in a second. So we knew the PGRs were working. But if they weren't using those models, they would say, hey, that PGR doesn't work anymore. This product, this is crap. You know, why did I waste my money on it? So we needed some kind of a model to help guide these applications because our eyes aren't going to really tell us if we're getting clipping yield suppression or rebound. Therefore, are we getting these plant health benefits or not? So look at the, I looked at the PLAS research. This is you know, before I started my research in 2005. We found that um, during the summertime, we see a, a reduction in the efficacy of the product, specifically how long did it last. So we found that it lasted uh, for a pretty short so if I wanted to visualize that curve I showed before, which would be in that blue line, when it's really hot outside, and I'm talking about Ithaca heat wave, so the average temperature would be 90 degrees. So that's like a high of you know, upper 90s, lows in the upper 70s. You know, we're seeing like seven days of growth suppression out of these, these products like Primo Mac, which are next to that Gethel. But then we go to kind of weather like we're having right now, or maybe even colder than right now, we might get three, uh, uh, three weeks growth suppression um, with that same product. And so this was, you know, something we did in early 2000s. It got published in 2009. And now how do I get this into the hands of, of our superintendents, right? That's a challenge to me as, a, as an extension specialist. Can I make this easy? And, you know, talking about a sine wave curve is a really good way for people's eyes to glaze over really, really quickly, right? So um, what we wanted to do was try to see if there's, is there some kind of a way that we can predict these timings. So what we did is we applied a growing degree day based approach to trying to see if we could understand this, the skew and the period of the sine wave based on growing degree day accumulation and get away from thinking about things in calendar days. So this research was started in 2008. It's pretty boring, it's pretty simple. I think it's kind of a novel way of thinking about something, but actually doing it, it's not very hard. You go out, you spray your plant growth regulators, and then you just collect clippings over and over and over every day for 10 years. So right now we're up to about 70,000 clippings have been collected from this research. And you have different PGRs, different rates, different grass areas, it's a lot. And then all you do is we just fit the relative clipping yield to the growing degree date, uh, data. And then from that, we can estimate what our application intervals are. So our first study was done with this Tranexapac ethyl on bent grass budding greens. And what we, we found when we applied as the label said, every four weeks that we would apply the PGR and then we'd have suppression and then it wear off and we get that rebound. So very counterintuitive, counterproductive, not helping the health of our plant out. We'd reapply, suppression, rebound, suppression, and then the uh, starting to occur on that third application. So obviously not what we wanna do. But we took all this data, instead of plotting it as calendar day on the bottom, we did it as cumulative growing degree days after application, so this is application at day zero, and then growing degree days, which is just a summation of the average air temperature in uh, degrees Celsius we use with a base of zero degrees Celsius, which is in grass. We tested different bases, and the, the base zero had the, the greatest pseudo R squared value, so that's why we had confidence in that. But we found that 
For about zero to 200 growing degree days after application, we had suppression. And then from about three to 800 growing degree days, we had a rebound. And so if we, based on our research now, say would apply it 230 or fewer growing degree days, we'd be able to maintain that clipping yield suppression. So this could be, if the average temperature is 20 degrees, that's 10 days. If the average temperature is 10 degrees, you got 20 day intervals, right? So now it's being flexible. So we're applying these herbicides and these plant protecting products based on the metabolism of the product and not just based on what the label says for a calendar interval. So when we, when we applied PGRs every 200 growing degree days, we had a nice even clipping yield suppression, averaging about 15% less than the, the control. And it you know, was at or below the control for the entire growing season. As a result, we saw an improvement in the color and the quality and the density of that plant. You see an improvement in things like shade tolerance and heat tolerance. And uh, we found out that that application rate didn't really affect the interval very much. And I won't really talk about that today for, for lack of time, but if you go at higher rates, instead of having 15% average suppression, you might get 30%. So we've been doing this now for 10 years. That was the first study. And we've been doing it for all these different plant growth regulators. And this is just the table for one putting green. So this is creeping bent grass putting green. The rate range, so what the rate effect would have on the amount of suppression, what the ideal intervals would be in growing degree days for all the different products. And then the superintendent started mixing products on me and they start asking, well, what if I mix this product with that product? You know, how much suppression do I get? How long does it last, right? And so these are some really challenging questions. I go, I don't know. I get to figure it out yourself, I guess. So again, I'm taking all this data and I, I can get it published and it's great. But that's not the last step. The last step is getting it into the hands of our end users so that they can actually use it and make decisions in how they're applying their products. So as a non-computer person, but a data person, as most of you guys are, you go to Excel. So you build Excel sheets like this. And I was pretty proud of this. There's a lot of if then statements in there and looking up of files and color code based on things. So the superintendent would come in, pick their temperature unit, their active ingredient, the rate they wanted to use. Then our models would kick in on the backside, tell them what their ideal growing degree day interval should be. If they wanted to make their own, they could even set their own interval. And then I would come in and they could pick as, if the days they applied the plant growth regulators. And then it would tell them what their cumulative growing degree days were and their approximate levels of clipping yield suppression. And then they would warn them when they need to reapply. I even did some extra if thens in there. So you could even put in the forecast of weather. And so you could say, oh, maybe I have to reapply on uh, this date, even though it's currently, you know, a week away. It works pretty well. It's worked really well for bentgrass greens but there were some challenges there. Another question someone asked was, well, this is great. I'm really bad at sprayer math. So can you help me out with the sprayer math? So you go to another sheet and you, you have them put in this, the area that they want to spray and you know, the sprayer setup, how many gallons of, of water are they going to put over an acre? And then what products do they want to use? And so you start building all this into Excel and you put it out there on your website and people start downloading it. But there's some problems with that. The first one is new versions. So every time I get new model data and I need to add something to it, I can't just easily go off to everybody and say, hey, here's the new version of the website, of the app. You gotta stop using the old one and use the new one, right? So that was always an issue. Another problem was bugs and more typically user problems. You could imagine if you had a cell that's got like five if then statements in there and someone clicks the wrong cell and then they send it to you and say, can you fix this for me? It's a little frustrating. <clears throat> their problem too is they had to manually enter their weather data over and over and over. And so those are some of the kind of the, the functional problems with an Excel type of a, an approach to, to using uh, uh, these different types of models. I know Cornell's got some great models. They're Excel based um, for things like soil test interpretations and mineralization and they're really good, but it can be a little bit intimidating. Even for me, I feel like I know, should know what's going on. I still look at that and go like, okay, how do I do this you know, the right way? From a bigger picture perspective though, as an extension educator, I'm constantly asked about, <clears throat> you know, how do you document this kind of stuff? How do you document your, your impact? Instead of just saying like, well, 
it was downloaded 400 times. Well, big deal. Are 400 people actually using it? Are they actually implementing the recommendations based on this? So they just downloaded it once and then you know, threw it out because they didn't know how to use it. And so that's another problem that we have an extension as it is. How do we document what we're doing? If we write a, a publication about how we should do something, but then we don't really, and they can count you know, how many times it's downloaded, we still don't know are people actually doing it. Are we getting a change in practice? And so we needed some way that was more interactive. This is very one-sided. I give them information, it goes out to them, they choose to use it or not. I want something that I give out to them, they can use, but then as they're using it, it's coming back to me so that I can understand, you know, how are they using these products? Are they implementing it? What are some ways I could evolve my research to, to maybe to meet some of the challenges that they're giving me? So I need, I need some more communication through my extension. So it, was, it became pretty clear to me, and this actually came to me, clear to me at Cornell. Uh, uh, one of my good friends, Ian Small, was a uh, uh, plant pathology uh, PhD student working on decision support tool in Bill Fry's lab. And I was like, I got this idea for one for turf too, man, for these plant growth regulators. And he's like, oh, that's cool, Bill. And so I left uh, Cornell, and I, you know, now I'm a professor, and I have a startup package. And I'm like, I want to put some money into actually trying to build an app which is really intimidating, right? Because none of us have a background in, in really software design and, and, and it's a whole language and, and something that we're just not really comfortable with. It, it took some time, uh, it took about two years. And so the first thing you're thinking about is you gotta find developers that you can actually do this. And in Lincoln, we're having this surge of, they call it the Silicon Prairie now. All these companies are coming from Silicon Valley to cheap Nebraska. <clears throat> There's a wealth of uh, student uh, new graduates and so it's hard to find even developers and you get what you pay for you can pay a lot of money like 200 grand to build an app and it might be awesome but if you miss the mark on anything well then you gotta redevelop it and it's gonna be 200 more thousand dollars to get it there or you do what i do and you, you you hire some cheaper small firm and you take forever and they're not responsive so it took a couple of years to kind of get things going Funding support was important. So one of the things I did is I went to my department head and said, I have this idea. Can you help, you know, help me with that initial startup cost? If you start making money on it, I'll pay you back. If we don't make money on it, then I guess you're out. So, you know, not a lot of risk for him, but he still said it's a good enough idea. We're going to do it. <clears throat> Design considerations. This is huge when building an app. It's got to be intuitive. People on your phone right now, I'm sure, you're realizing if the app is not intuitive and easy, you're not gonna use it, right? And only you know how a grower is going to use this type of technology because you've probably done it. You work with them in the field. You know what they wanna see, you know what they don't wanna see. An app guy, my first attempt at this, they did it, did it themselves. It was hideous and ugly and non-functional. So now I have to come in and every time we do variants, I draw it up in, in PowerPoint. Say, this is what I want to do, this is how it has to work. It takes time, but you save time and money later on because you're not redoing their, their initial attempt, which usually is nowhere near what an end user would do. And then you spend all this money, you're on the hook, and now you have to figure out how am I gonna advertise it and how am I gonna get adoption? The benefit there is having that big Twitter following. Um, and if you build something that works, you get this good word of mouth, especially in a tight-knit community like the turf industry. And so we've seen really nice adoption of it. <clears throat> this is not Greenkeeper. This is what I did for my, my interview, though, at Nebraska. So I came in right away and said, this is what I want to build when I get here. And so I drew this up right before my interview. You know, it had things like my record keeper and my, my, the weather forecast and pest outbreak maps and uh, online resources that link to our, our information. It was going to display things like what products were applied. So I could keep track of my PGRs. If I'm tracking my PGRs, I can also track fungicides, I can track fertilizers, I can track water, right? So that just kind of became intuitive. And if I know someone's spraying a lot of fungicide, for example, now I can start seeing where they are and start building maps to understand, oh, maybe we're having a lot of uh, dollar spot outbreak in Southeast Nebraska. Other users could then gain and learn from that. So instead of having to pick up the phone and say, hey, what are you seeing at your course right now? They can just go onto the app and they can see what's kind of going on in their region. So over time, <clears throat> we've ended up building our app called Greenkeeper. 
And so this is a decision support tool. It's got a terrible name. It's Greenkeeper app. It's not really an app you download. It's a web-based app, but that really confuses people. So if you're ever going to build an app, make sure it's really a, like a native app for your phone or just call it Greenkeeper, which is the way I try to refer to it now. Unfortunately, that domain was not available. So Greenkeeper app is, is where it's at right now. And so you can access it through your internet browser. One nice thing about this is, think about your growers. They are gonna be in the field, they're gonna to wanna to see it on their phone, they might see it on a tablet, they might be doing a lot of data entry on their computer. So by doing a web-based app, now they have a lot more flexibility in, uh, in how they can interact with that and they can see it and access their data at any, uh, any, any location. This is what it really looks like. It is not pretty. In the, in the app side, we call this front end. Front end makes things look beautiful. My guys love doing the back end stuff, figuring out the algorithms, figuring out the code. They hate front end. So that's the thing. I can hire someone to make it look pretty. What we're finding from our superintendents is they love it because it's ugly, but it's simple and it's easy. So they can log in. They can see what's been applied to their greens. They can watch the products expire. Uh, they can see how they've been fertilizing. If you scroll down, they can look at the weather. They get reminders when things you know, come out of control. Um, and so it's, it's real simple. Websites, if you look at, if you look at, ever do any website analytics to see how many people are using your site, one thing people want is a low number, it's called their bounce rate. A bounce rate means you go onto the website and then the, you want someone to stick there and click around. They don't want them to like log onto your site and say this, I don't need anything here and just leave. But for me, I want a decent bounce rate because I want my superintendents to log in every day, look at the homepage and go, I'm pretty good today. I can go on and do something else, right? So that's actually a good thing to have sometimes. You just have to know what the goal of the app is and what your clients need. So our PGR display is real easy now. The, the app already keeps track of 570 variants of those growing ingredient models. So they don't have to know all of the, the ins and outs of the model. It automatically grabs weather data every night. I have to pay for that. It used to be $600 a month. We switched it over to a different provider. Now it's 50 bucks a month, um, but you know, it's automatically getting the weather data and the 10 day forecast. So for these PGRs, for example, this one trim it, Pacuzuchi's all, what I was spraying for was a PGR. The day I sprayed, the day is likely to expire based on the forecast. In this case, it really has expired. The amount of growing degree days that we're at versus what we, our goal reapplication interval was, and then how much suppression and rebound that we get. So this treatment is starting to go from suppression into rebound, whereas this Primo Max on the T's is still not yet expired and it's going to expire you know, several weeks later. So real quick, superintendent looks at it and go, oh, I'm gonna spray next Monday. I'll throw the Primo in the tank then. They go on with their day. It's quick and it's easy and all the data is in the background. We've also then expanded it to do things like the sprayer mixing. We know they struggle with math. So they just come in now and they pick, I'm treating my greens. This is the sprayer, it tells them how many tanks, how many gallons, and then they come in, they pick the products they wanna use, the rates, the pests, the interval they'd like to use if it's not based on growing degree days. And it gives them a nice list of how much product is needed to make a full tank, to mix partial tanks. It keeps track of all this inventory, and so it's real simple for a superintendent to then you know, have that, and they push the finalized mix, they get a PDF, they can print off, they give it off to a spray tech or an intern, and they mix it up and there's less chance for a math error. And so right there, we can have a big impact by trying to minimize some of those math errors. The onus comes on to me, though, for that math to be right, right? So you have to do a lot of, uh, we call it QA, uh, uh, quality assurance, to make sure that you, know, you do different models so you make sure your math is working the way that it needs to work. So those are kind of the big features of Greenkeeper initially. And so over the last two years, we've gone from zero to 3,800 courses, 5,900 users, multiple users can be shared at one course, and we've tracked 89,000 different products. So when I'm talking about extension impacts now, that's my impact. I can show who is using it, how it's being used, how often are they logging in, but more importantly right here, products being tracked. I can see how are they using this PGR on fairways? How are they using this PGR on greens? What rates are they using? What intervals do they like? All of a sudden now I can document my impact to my extension dean to show that my research is being applied directly to growers and they're using it. And that's something you get when you, you develop an app like this. 
So, you know, Google Analytics is great. So right now, you know, we're doing about 1.7 uh, uh, thousand uh, logins um, a month from our different users. And so we have a bunch of users that try it out, but these are kind of our monthly active users, 1.7 or 100, 1,700 users. It's just really, really great amount of uh, adoption um, for, through the app. <coughs> Our users are highly engaged, which is great. Um, they give us amazing testimonials, like uh, uh, Bill Keen here. You know, with Greenkeeper, I've made five fewer PGR apps to my greens and two fewer to my fairways. That's real savings in products and labor. Another way you can really document your impact if you're an extension specialist. Um, the other problem trade off there, though, is they give you a lot of feedback. They feel invested in this. So they're going to tell you what they want, what they like, what they don't like. That's all kind of being. Uh, uh, added and it's great because then you do what they want they tell their buddies about how they you know that they had the idea for this and we did this and it, it's continuing to make this uh, this decision support tool grow so if you're thinking about developing a tool like this the, the, the most important thing to remember to make it successful is that you need to offer your end users more value and, and time and money than they put into the application there's a lot of apps out there where you're gonna, they want you to enter all this information, you know, everything, but they don't really give anything back. This app is giving you so much information back with pest models and fertilizer tracking, fertilizer recommendations, these PGR models that can be complex for people to calculate. It's all right there and it's automatically updating for them. And so that it's worth their time to then give you all their sprayer information to assess your impact. So you know, like this the new dollar spot model. Again, make it real simple so that we have all their areas there. They put a stress disease threshold there, risk threshold. Instead of they can look at some really complex model, it automatically tells them not the number, just are they protected or at risk? Real simple, real quick. It, can, it, it consults with the, uh, what fungicides have been sprayed. If a fungicide had been sprayed on these back nine T's and the family uh, threshold was above 20%, it would just say protected because you're still protected. The, the grower doesn't need to know, oh, that fungicide protects against this disease. It's automatically right there. Another like pet peeve of mine is soils. We've all, you know, we do modeling and, and try to understand what the, the soil uh, phosphorus, potassium levels are and that's for maintaining our turf. But then you look at soil test reports from labs and they're gonna analyze everything. Oh, your molybdenum is no low. What are you talking about your molybdenum is low? Like, it's crazy. There's no research to support that, that number. So then we said, okay, well, we can do soil testing. We can do tissue testing in here. You just pick where you're sampled from. It knows about your site. You give a little barcode, you send it off to a lab. Two days later, we get the important thing. Soil pH, buffer pH, organic matter, malic 3, malic uh, uh, phosphorus, malic potassium. The things that are actually important. And then we give university recommendations. So if, if you're doing like a salt test on sand and you think your sodium is high, it just says, interpretation says not applicable. You're on sand. You don't have deflocculation of clay, right? Other labs would try to scare you and tell you you got to pull these products down. Now we can just pump university recommendations right into a tool and we can do it cheap. We do like 20 bucks for a sample. An independent soils consultants can charge you $100 for a sample. And so we can just kind of cut some of that right out of the system. There, has, there have been some growing pains. Um, we've been growing a lot. And the university came to us and said, Bill, this is awesome. You need to form an LLC. It's like, cool. You know, I had the support and the protection of the big university behind you. You know, there's, there's pretty low risk. Um, who here has ever done a SWOT analysis? You know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Universities. Come on, we don't have SWOT analysis. We don't, we, when you're, you have protection behind you. If you're a private industry, you better know those, you know, your, th your weaknesses and your threats really clearly. So I was a little bit scared about that. But they said, first of all, you're making money and university is nonprofit, so that's a problem. Uh, you're collecting credit cards. State law in Nebraska says we cannot store credit card information. So that was a problem. And then you have all the university constraints about user agreements and how do you use the logo and all this stuff it just got crazy so we had to form an llc uh, another cornell alumni my master's advisor doug sold that and i formed our turf grade llc and now we pay a small royalty to our, our revenue to uh, nebraska the other problem comes up then is well, now we have all these ideas but how do we fund it 
right? It's a free app. People want stuff for free online. Like for some reason, people think they don't have to pay for stuff online. So there's different, mo there's different models out there for us to kind of make this work. Um, but, you know, looking for partnerships, looking at ways to grow the Greenkeeper app and so develop rapidly because there's other apps out there. And if we're not developing, then we're going to have some problems. And then, you know, just the challenges of trying to run a small growing startup on top of having a three-way appointment as a professor. So these are some of the challenges that I've been trying to face. The university has <laughs> been very supportive of this because they are getting some royalty money out of it. Um, but it's just some of the issues that I'm having. So if, if you're thinking about developing an app and successful, these are some real things that come along a couple of years later that are going to kind of smack you in the face and you have to be kind of aware of. As I kind of wrap up, though, I wanted to just show, you know, where is the app going? It's much, it's going to be much broader than the things I've showed uh, today. And, you know, I'm not doing much PGR research. We've done a lot of it. Um, but now we're doing, we're getting into GPS sprayers, variable rate sensors. You know, the big thing in, in, in egg crops is sensors on, mo or on drones. But we don't need that in turf. Why? Do we take a drone over our grass every day or every three days, right? And it's got an active sensor connected to a battery. So we can have really nice crop monitoring, um, uh, crop, monitoring uh, crop scouting technologies just sitting on the back of a mower. And so from that, we can look at water status and disease and, and nitrogen status. And, and so this is some of the data that we've been collecting. Um, this is just a different fairway over time. Uh, as you can see, the stress starts picking up in the summertime. Um, so we're able to start looking at that and modeling that. And so all the research that we're doing now is getting pumped right back into um, our greenkeeper. So we're trying to balance, you know, our research to make sure we're sitting the needs that, that we need for precision turf management. And so this, this is one, uh, one of the things I think we're really excited about going forward. Um, if you don't want to use a sensor on a mower, you can all use it on a Segway. So this is uh, one of our, our GIS guys who's, uh, you know, is also a pilot, but he's got his, his uh, Holland Scientific ACS 430 crop sensor on there, and he's just driving a putting green. And uh, from that, you know, we can get a, we can learn a lot about um, you know how that putting green grass is performing, how nitrogen is is, is performing uh, at the stand. And then ultimately, you know, I want Greenkeeper to look something like this. So this is kind of a Google Earth uh, overlay of the different fairways here at. Um, uh, this Jim Ager golf course is a golf course that I, I um, kind of took over from the city. Our students now take care of it. This is awesome. Your students are taking care of it. They're getting real world experience. And then I can use it as a research test facility. And so now we're looking at, you know, doing GPS variable rate and applications to try to even out some of these differences in the chlorophyll content of, uh, of these leaves. And so um, I think it's a pretty cool opportunity to have that uh, in Lincoln. So I'm not going to go long because Katie and I both remember sitting at and seminars that just go way over. So I'm going to wrap up here because I know you guys probably want to get down with your day. Um, if you're thinking about decision support tools and extension, I think it's a great way to engage your growers and to expand your audience. And it's really interactive. You're getting it two-sided. You're not just, you know, providing information and just hoping and praying that they're actually using what you're telling them. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities out there. This is turf. But a lot of, especially our highly maintained specialty crops, and we see a lot of applications being applied. Um, a lot of data could be being collected. You know, I think there's ap applications in there. Apples, grapes, greenhouse. My wife is doing hop stuff now in Nebraska and just keeping track of all that. You know, downy mildew pressure, applications, fertility, drip lines, ET, a lot of data. You could build these types of interfaces for lots of different crops out there. It's a great way for, our, for us to integrate our science uh, in a way that's intuitive and helpful to our growers and something that they want to engage in. And that's how you can go from zero users to, you know, 3,800 golf courses in two years. In perspective, there's about 12,500 pretty nicely maintained golf courses in the United States. So for us to have about a quarter of those, you know, maintained golf courses, it kind of takes a count for the 3,000 mom and pops that, you know, are barely solvent. Uh, I think it's a pretty um, massive amount of, of, of integration and it's just by using the, our data and putting it in a way that's intuitive and helpful and easy. So thank you very much for having me today. I'd be happy to entertain any questions uh, now or um, I, you know, after uh, 110 uh, somewhere else. So thanks a lot.
the person is so kind to leave time for convenience. Are there questions for Billy? I have a question, Geneva. Let's start with Geneva. Why don't we start with Geneva? Questions from Geneva? Yes. Um, this, hi, Bill. It's Jennifer Grant. Um, hi, Jennifer. Hi, I had two questions for you. You talked about, uh, you know, keeping the competitive edge and that there's a lot of com competition out there. Um, could you comment on what you see as competition um, in the turf industry right now for these, for this type of information and applications? And secondly, I wondered, I wondered if um, you have uh, many or any non-golf course users. Yeah, the, the first, the, I'll just answer the second question first. Um, that's, um, we have sports turf people are using it. We actually have athletic fields built in as an area type within Greenkeeper. Um, so in the ground ingredient models for sports turf is also in Greenkeeper. Um, I guess from a competition perspective, uh, there's different apps out there. There's a bunch like OnLink and, and Playbooks. And a lot of them are keeping track of apps, but it's different from us versus them is we're giving them the uh, user's information back by having those models in there. And some of those 570 models I haven't published because I haven't been proprietary. So, you know, they just can't put it into their apps. And so that's an issue. I think the biggest threat right now for us is a lot of apps. There's a lot of like drone technologies or, and sensor technologies for soil moisture meters. And we're seeing partnerships happen really rapidly. And so I think that's going to be the one thing we look at is, you know, making us uh, constantly assessing how those partnerships are forming and looking at it from a business perspective now that it's an LLC and not just a university app. Thank you. Yep. Any more from Bill. Geneva? Okay. No. So your screen up there says protected from dollar spot. So what happens when the golf course does get dollar spot? Uh, do, do, so the, that if you go back to that, they, they can actually pick their threshold and so what you'd say then is, okay, maybe you have a weaker cultivar of, of, uh, of grass. And so you have to go to lower th uh, action thresholds. Yeah. And so that's the way we kind of make that happen. Um, and also too, when they put in their interval for how long those fungicides last, if they know it's really high pressure, don't put a 28 day interval if you know it's only gonna last 14 days. My counterpart in Wisconsin too, is trying to take some of this growing degree day type uh, environmental degradation uh, modeling research and applying it to fungicides and other types of uh, control products too. So we can try to, to put this um, together with uh, other products. The bigger challenge there is PGRs are easy. When the PGR is gone, it starts to wear, it starts to respond. The, P, the, the fungicide is gone from the plant tissue, it's still maybe having an impact on the pest. And so there's gonna be a lot more dynamic there when you're dealing with the plant residual and the pest response to that, that uh, critical dose of that pesticide. So it's a little bit more challenging than the PGR, which is a pretty easy way. Um, uh, two quick questions. One is, do you have evaluation uh, built into the app? And then the second is, um, is there any way to track from these users, uh, gee, I, I was able to reduce my, my pesticide, herbicide, fungicide, whatever use over time, which I would think would give you a really good market. Yeah, that's one thing we don't have yet. And we talked about is, you know, we can pool data and they can look at how their numbers, either an active ingredient has been reduced or their EIQ or whatever metric that you want to use to assess the risk. And then we can rate, how has my number changed over time? But more importantly, maybe more helpful is, how are you doing relative to your peers in your area? And so now if you're, you're looking like, well, I'm really high and I'm really expensive and they're really low, you know, what are they doing differently? How can I change my management? So I think that that would be you know, one way and we're working on that uh, right now with some of the, the new algorithms from a, from a price and a use perspective. And your first question was, um, sorry. About the, evaluation built. the evaluation is not uh, built in yet. We're just running through like survey monkeys and, and uh, but we're getting a lot of feedback through just looking at how the products are being used in different regions too. So we don't even have to use their biased um, results. We can look at their actual product use. And so they can say they're good, but I see, you know, their low, low, low use at this golf course may be very different than that golf course. And so sometimes there can be some bias in how they answer those surveys. It would seem really good ROI if, you know, they had, if you had that kind of data about, and have they been able to reduce? Yeah. Good for them, their PR, good for you. And we have that in the survey monkey, so we get a lot of that too. But we, think, we find them that they're both, they're both equally uh, effective, but kind of from different angles. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. 
amazing what you've done in such a short period of time since I still remember you as a grad student. <laughs> it's very impressive. So um, I'd like to find out what you think the future of extension is at Land Grant University is 10 years from now, because what you're doing, I really think it should be expanded further. The problem is, what the bottleneck is, is that, for example, you had to work with um, another, uh, another firm, and so a lot of us have to work with programmers, individual programmers, and so that process, I believe, is the bottleneck. So do you think at land-grant universities we should have our own, extent, in extension, our own um, programmers, like a yeah. data science core, that's specifically working with us to get these types of tools? <clears throat> extension isn't writing just articles anymore, right? It's doing podcasts like Frank does, or I do videos now, or it's building apps. And we need the infrastructure at universities to produce a diversity of media, and I don't think we have it. I keep pushing my department head to say we need a podcast booth. Or I can go in with good microphones and it's soundproof. And it's not me in an echoey office with the fan blowing on from the air conditioner vent. So I think that that's definitely something that would make a lot of sense. I tried to go internal with the app and um, this kind of dysfunction within their, that world, I had to go external and uh, pay someone else to, to do it. So I think having those resources would make extension a, a lot better. And then finding ways to, to fund ourselves, right? We're not going to be getting a lot of federal funding anymore or state funding. So doing things like this, you know, money now is going directly back into my program to support extension, to support research. And so finding revenue models. Uh, I think one of the challenges, though, is, you know, that's what our university is telling us to do. I did that. I'm going to be the poster child of it. And what they do, tell me to start an LLC. So, you know, it, it, it directly finances me and helps me out as a company owner and the university gets some royalty back but they need to have some better way of, of figuring out how to raise money in extension so we can build these tools and, and, uh, and you know, not just charge for downloads of a you know some kind of a neb guide or some kind of a pamphlet um, and, and I think these tools are are really some way where we can actually make a lot of money selling decision support tools and taking our brains and helping our growers you know make the right decisions sounds like a good end yeah, thank you This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.